Hello, this is Ortha Tomeo, hitting the mark with the biblical text, and I am Dr. S.W. Kibler, your guide into the biblical text, where truth lives. Thank you so much for joining me today as we continue our study of the book of Genesis. And uh, as it's properly called, the Sefer uh, Bereshit in the Hebrew, the beginning. We endeavor to take aim and hit the target. And not just a target, but the bullseye. As we study this biblical text, we forsake church traditions. We're not looking at denominational beliefs. We're relying only upon the biblical text. And we will find that there is documented historical data and scientific data that accentuates our understanding of the biblical text and gives credibility and proof. So we will include that when necessary. We uh, began looking, uh, this is part three, of the formation of mankind. Uh, last week we looked at man as uh, being created in the image of Elohim. And I proposed that the image of God was something that man was created with rather than in. Right? As understood with the English language, uh, that word, the preposition in. Uh, and I understand that looking at man being created as the image of God is a divergence from contemporary teaching and preaching, but it is accurate. Mankind was created as the imager of Elohim, of God. It's a capacity, a status. It's rather than the preposition in as something mankind possessed. It's as. It's something that mankind was. He had the capacity to be. I have today a translation of the Hebrew into English. And I just wanted to show it to you. I've highlighted that specific term, Beth Selim, which means as or in the capacity of. And so let's go ahead and just read that very quickly here. So I'm going to go ahead and... See if I can't expand this a little bit. There we go. No, that wasn't it either. Let me grab a hold of the right one. There we go. So you see the Hebrew text at the top. So let's read here. It says, God created man with his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And as you can see, uh, there is the word Beth Selim, And that is the term, the word that means as or in the capacity of. So mankind was created as the imager of Elohim. As the imager of Elohim. The Most High God, mankind was to represent an image, Yahweh Elohim, on earth and to all of the rest of creation. So we read further on. And it tells us that God blessed them. God said to them, be fertile and become many. Fill the land and conquer it. Dominate the fish of the sea, the birds uh, of the sky, and every beast that walks the land. What the biblical text is telling us is man was to make the rest of the earth as the Garden of Eden. The whole earth wasn't perfect. It was, I mean, it... It wasn't corrupted because of sin yet, but it wasn't the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was not the whole earth. It was a portion of the earth directly attached to a place called Eden. It was the Garden of Eden. And there was a place called Eden. Now we're going to be reading in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis. And what you'll notice, just a little point of interest, is that actually chapter 1... The thought process of chapter 1 doesn't end until chapter 2, verse 3. That ends the thought process and context of what's covered in chapter 1. The thought process and context of chapter 2 actually begins in verse 4. So you can take a look at that. And uh, it's quite it's quite evident that that's, that's the way it is. Why they separated the the chapters where they did, I have no clue. But we're going to be reading out of chapter 2, which is a more in-depth account of the creation of humankind. Much, much more detailed. 
So let's read in chapter 2, and it's quite lengthy. We're going to read verses 4 through 24. Okay, so I have it here. Let me go ahead and expand this back out, and you can follow along with me if you can read that. All right, so this is chapter 2, 4 through 24. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in that day. The Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God caused, uh, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. <clears throat> Picture that. Water flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first the Pishon when they flowed around the whole land. It's where there's a lot of gold. It's really good. Padulum and ox, uh, onyx. And then the name of the second river is Gihon, and it was the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris, flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. That is to, to protect its integrity. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You surely... Uh, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living thing, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a sleep to come uh, fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And that rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we want to look at this, that about this garden. This, we're going to spend some time on the garden because it's really important. And it's going to make a big difference as we go through the rest of the Bible. Okay. So let's look at this place that Yahweh created specifically for mankind to initially live and <coughs> that mankind was to expand to the rest of the earth. Eden means pleasure in Hebrew. Eden was a place and the garden was located on the east side of Eden. It's important for us to understand, to grasp this context that we find in the biblical text. Now. I have a house and I have some property and I have a garden. Like many of you who might raise plants, I have a garden it's outside my house. And it's specifically watered, specially watered. I have water specially there for the garden to water it. And I specifically planted certain vegetables and fruits in that garden for food. The garden is not part of my house. My garden really is located on the east side of my house. <laughs> Nearly every day I walk out, go out of my house, and I go into my garden through the gate. I have, right, it's a really nice place. I have a fence around it. Right? And in that fence, I have a gate. That's where I go in and out. My garden is a designated place that has parameters. Right? Fence. So big, entrance and exit, and a water supply for the plants. Now, you have a garden, 
you know that it has parameters. Um, it may have a fence around it, you may have a gate. And you might have even visualized what my garden might look like. But if you can see that and understand what I've been talking about, my own garden, then we can apply that to what the biblical text is saying about the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was a garden located outside of what is called Eden. Right? It was on the east side of Eden. Eden means pleasure, sometimes referred to as paradise. It had parameters. It had a water source. And we'll find that it had an entrance and an exit. Okay? Now, unlike my garden, the Garden of Eden was part of a mountain as well. Now, bear with me. Uh, everything we're looking at is going to be important. And uh, many of you may have never heard that the Garden of Eden was adjacent to or on a mountain. But that's what the biblical text tells us. And the mountain of God is referred to quite often in Scripture. So here is the Scripture verse, one of them, that describes the Garden of Eden as being part of a mountain. And we're going to look at uh, Ezekiel. Uh, 28 13 through 14 and we're not going to discuss who this is talking about because we'll we'll talk about that when we get to Ezekiel um, but what we want to do is look at what's referenced here to Eden it says you were in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was your covering sardis tobaz diamond beryl ox and jasper sapphire emerald and carbuncle and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings on the day that you were created they were prepared your anointed guardian cherub i placed you you were on the holy mountain of god in the midst of the stones of fire you walk so there we have this this uh, consolidation of the garden of eden as a garden and a mountain they're both true they're both true now I'm sure you're all aware that water does not flow uphill. Water flows downhill. So there's just another piece of evidence that the river that flowed through the Garden of Eden came from Eden and was flowing downhill, right? Upper elevation to a lower elevation. This is what the river did that flowed through the Garden of Eden and it divided into four other rivers. Eden was the source of the water. It flowed from Eden. Eden was the source of the water. Okay, So you can kind of picture that, the mountain, the source of water, the river flowing down, down, downhill, down elevation, and going through what is called the Garden of Eden. So now we're going to look at um, just a little closer, the Garden of Eden and the Holy Mountain of God. So people in the ancient Near East, they uh, believed that gods lived in lush gardens, uh, top mountains. Uh, it, both uh, settings were luxurious right? and remote. And this is some of what they associated with the gods this luxury and remoteness. Mountains uh, were considered uh, the fine abodes because they were uh, remote. They were hard to get to. And a lot of the gods didn't like associating with humanity. They didn't like humanity. Uh, a lot of them still don't like humanity. So this perception was very widespread and people uh, in all areas, they, they, they adopted this and they understood this. It was part of what they knew, the gods lived in gardens and on mountains. And so in areas where the terrain was not naturally mountainous, they would build man-made mountains. Man-made mountains, and they're just, they're called ziggurats. That's what they were. They're considered as the mountain temples where the gods met humanity. There wasn't a natural mountain. People made a mountain. We called them ziggurats. They built them. And this is part of the uh, biblical text specifics that we read about the Tower of Babel. It was a ziggurat. 
And what we find is it was not made out of natural stone. It was not a natural mountain. They weren't ex excavating a mountain. They made blocks, bricks out of clay to build this man-made mountain in order to reach the gods. And that's one of the things that really ticked Yahweh Elohim off. They were constructing a man-made mountain to meet the gods. Okay, So, uh, Eden was the dwelling place of Elohim. Elohim. El Elyon. Yahweh Elohim. The creator God. It was God's garden where he placed mankind. Just like I have a house here and there's a garden outside. God's abode was in Eden. And he placed a garden in the east of Eden. And the river flowed into it. And it had parameters. And as I mentioned, we'll find out that it had an entrance. And uh, we'll read about that in chapter 3. But in Genesis uh, 2.8, we read, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Man was formed, created, outside of the Garden of Eden. He was not made created inside the Garden of Eden. He was made outside of the Garden of Eden. Then God placed the man inside the garden. It's important that we grasp this as well. Okay? Man was not created in the Garden of Eden. Man did not just wander into the Garden of Eden. Man was placed into the Garden of Eden by Yahweh Elohim. Man didn't decide he wanted to live in the garden. He wasn't living on the outside of the garden and looked inside and saw how nice it was and then tried to climb over the fence to get into the garden. No, it was intentional act of Yahweh Elohim, not only to create man, but also to place man specifically in the garden that he had specifically made for man. Everything was specific. Everything was intentional. This garden was adjacent to Yahweh Elohim's abode, the mountain of God. Yahweh Elohim intended for mankind to be close to him. That's what, that's what God wanted. That's what Elohim wanted. He intended for man to be close to him and associate with him. This was part of God's plan, purpose. His intention for mankind was to have this type of relationship and fellowship. This is what God is doing. He's looking at building this family. He's, he's, he's creator God and he has this family of Adam and Eve and he tells them, be fruitful, right? Be fertile. Go make more family. And then this garden of perfection is spread it around the earth until it envelopes and encompasses the whole earth. That's what God wanted. This, this intimate family relationship. Yahweh Elohim intended for mankind to be so close and to have that kind of association with him. And that's related to mankind being created in the image of Elohim. Right? Mankind knew Yahweh Elohim, knew God, creator God, knew him in a very close way, very intimate way, in a family way. And we read in verse uh, 28 of chapter 1, it says, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Right? That means have dominion over, subdue it. Spread this perfection around. Not only the perfection that humanity was created in, but also the perfection of the rest of the creation. And that's part of what they were to protect it, right? To oversee it. To make sure that it didn't change. Because it was, it was made in perfection. Right? So now, this is God's plan for humanity. Elohim, Yahweh Elohim's intention was for mankind to expand this perfection, this garden, to eventually cover the earth. The place of pleasure and perfection was to increase until it enveloped the whole earth. And they were to be full, uh, fertile, multiply, grow their family. Elohim's intention for mankind was not only to be family, but also to increase the family. And that is still Yahweh Elohim's intention. But it was not every created being's intention. Some did not agree with what Yahweh Elohim had done. And they will attempt to corrupt and destroy mankind from being the imager of Elohim 
and that intention that God had for all of humanity and creation, and that intention that God, that Elohim had for humanity to be family, be part of his family. And we read about this throughout Scripture. We're going to read about it in chapter 3 of Genesis. We're going to read about it in chapter 6 of Genesis. We're going to read about it in chapter 11 in Genesis. Very specifically, we'll read about it in Deuteronomy, especially 32. We're going to read about it in Psalms. We're going to see the, you know, the historical, uh, uh, the, the history play out of these, trying, these entities trying to destroy what God had done and trying to devastate God's intentions. Now, <clears throat> we're going to stop our Genesis study for this uh, video session right here. But we need to think about these things that were covered. And for some, it's, it's a lot, right? But the, the garden was in a specific location. It was outside a place called Eden. It was the Garden of Eden. Eden means pleasure. That's paradise. And Eden was on a mountain and the river flowed down the mountain and through the garden and that mountain was the holy mountain of God and that was God's abode and we read a little bit later that God walked in the garden he was there God dwelt on earth we know him as Yahweh Yahweh Elohim Yeshua some of you better known as Jesus Jesus the Christ and that God had an intention for man, and that was to multiply, to be his family, and then to not only occupy the garden, but to protect the essence of that garden that was made in perfection, and to spread it around until the whole entire earth was perfect, and that man was to remain perfect. Right? That, was, that was God's intention. That's his plan A, and it's still his plan A. God has not changed his plan. He still is fulfilling his plan A. We need to really concentrate also on this aspect of family. It's always been important to God. We find this throughout scripture. It's one of those themes that's so important that we often miss it, but it's right there so blatant, right? So evident. And it's one of the things that is so under attack today in our world is the family. And that's part of what Adam was to protect, family. Where he dwelt, the garden, his integrity, and to be fertile and fruitful and multiply, and protect his family, specifically the family that God intended. Right? So think about these things and go back, if you would just go back and read from Genesis chapter 1, from verse 27 and then read through chapter 2 through 24 and uh, just think about these things because it's going to make a lot of sense and it's going to be really important as we go and remember that there are these other gods we've talked about them that plural aspect of the term Elohim and uh, they're going to be better well defined as we have mentioned before as the sons of God or these extraterrestrial um, divine beings that we often term as angels not all of them agreed with God and what he was doing and they're going to try to destroy God's intentions they're going to try to destroy humanity and destroy this creation what I want us to do today though is think about family and I want us to turn now to the New Testament to the book of the gospel of John we're going to read one verse this in chapter 1 and it's verse 12 it says, but all who did receive him, and that him is referring to Yahweh Elohim, also known as Yeshua or Jesus. But to all who did receive him, what happened? Those that believed in his name, what, what happened to them? What change came upon them? It says he gave the right to become his children. That's a statement of family. He gave the right to become children of God. There's a very deep meaning. It's not, it's, it's very spiritual, right? But it's very intentional. That God wants his family. It's one of his original intentions for humanity. He wants his family. And Yahweh Elohim Yeshua 
is still desiring a family. And he is building his family one individual at a time. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So think on these things. This is Ortha Tamea, hitting the mark with the biblical text. I am Dr. S.W. Kibler, and I am encouraging you to know the truth, stand on the truth, and to speak the truth. God bless you.